Please, Please welcome, welcome to the stage District Governor nominee Mary Gask from Rotary District 7770. I'm from the South. I'm from South Carolina, so I'm going to start with good morning, y'all. Yes. Jeremy, hope you heard that. I got a good response. Yeah, we did. I never imagined standing in front of this many Rotarians. And if I had imagined it, I don't think my imagination would have had me wearing purple tennis shoes. But I wear them for a lot of reasons. I wear them because of Rotary's efforts to eradicate polio. I wear them for Rotary's efforts to empower girls and women. I wear them for the youth. And I also wear them to honor President Jennifer's imagination and inspiration. Thank you. Our next session is on the youth and the voice of youth. Engaging youth in our Rotary programs is important to Rotary's future. We know there are individuals that join Rotary just because we work so closely with our young kids. Our Rotaractors, our interactors, they bring us a different way of looking at things. For instance, when I was growing up, LOL did not mean laugh out loud. It meant little old lady. <laughs> but the kids bring us energy, excitement, and enthusiasm. As Stephanie would say, they are simply irresistible. Um, this morning, we're going to learn a little bit about our youth programs. But before we do that, I was handed a sheet of paper. Uh, Patrick Eakes mentioned earlier in the week that the centerpieces would morph over time. You can see over the days that they have gradually constructed President Jennifer's theme. Take a minute to appreciate the elements of the centerpiece because when you return from lunch, we will be featuring another aspect of our event and making a few more announcements about these fabulous centerpieces. So before we start our next session, let's welcome District Governor-elect Van Lankford from District 7690, and he will share his Rotary moment with you. My Rotary moment occurred in a restaurant in High Point, North Carolina in the early spring of 2017. I was in the restaurant having lunch with a gentleman who at that time was an acquaintance but now consider him a dear friend. The gentleman's name is familiar to many of you, Patrick Eakes. I invited Patrick to lunch that day to ask a favor. My son was about to complete his senior year at Western Carolina University. However, for him to, to graduate with his degree in sports management, he needed to do an internship in the sports field. Being from a small rural community, we had few options. So I decided to work some of my Rotary contacts to see if they could help. I mean, let's face it, Paul Harris intended for Rotary to be a networking organization. A quick Google search is all I needed to discover that Patrick was well connected in the sports avenues in Greensboro. We met, had lunch, and I told Patrick that my son Evan needed what he needed and then proceeded to tell him some of the sports-related internships he had already applied for in the Greensboro area. As I mentioned each opportunity, Evan had, as I mentioned each opportunity Evan had applied for, Patrick affirmed what I suspected all along. He knew just who to talk to. To make a long story short, my son was able to land a great internship in the summer of 2017 due to the help and guidance of Patrick Eakes. This internship was even mentioned by an employer in his first job interview he got out of college, which put him on the career path he's on today. My rotary moment came at the end of our lunch that day in High Point. As we were preparing to leave, and as I was paying the bill, I thanked Patrick profusely for his help and guidance. 
and was even a little apologetic that I had come to ask for his help when at that time we did not know each other that well. And I'll always remember what Patrick said to me that day. He said, Van, this is what Rotarians do for one another. I've had five years to reflect on that statement. This is what Rotarians do for one another. That statement caused me to take a deep look at all my relationships, both business and personal, and it occurred to me that Rotary has touched my life, my business, and now my family in a very positive way. I believe that statement is what has me standing before you today as District Governor-elect of District 7690 because in my belief system, when we are given something, it is our responsibility to give back. Thank you. Good morning, Rotarians. A wise man once said, Rotary believes as I believe. That it is possible to have a world without war. By educating future beast builders, working to ease conditions that breed violence and conflict, Rotary is demonstrating to the rest of the world that peace is attainable. And that wise man was Nobel Peace Prize Laureate Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. We are honored to have with us this morning Kandeka Tutu Shi, daughter of that wise man. <laughs> Kandeka is the CEO of the Desmond Tutu Tutu Desk Campaign, a charitable educational organization which addresses 95 million desk shortage in sub Saharan Africa. The Desmond Tutu Tutu Desk Campaign Center aims to provide 20 million environmentally friendly portable desks to schools in Africa by the year 2025, thus positively enhancing the lives of children, their communities, countries, and making Africa a more globally competitive continent through improved literacy and education. The eldest and nicest daughter of the Tutus. <laughs> she is passionate about enhancing peace, racial reconciliation, and equality by improving the health and educational experiences of young people, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, promoting global peace and justice. While completing her Masters of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta, Tandeka received several fellowships, including those from the Center for Disease Control, American Cancer Society, Agency for Toxic Substances and Diseases, the Southeast AIDS Training Center, and the Kalb Board of Health. Much of her working life has been in clinical research, both in the United States and in South Africa. Her catalog of accomplishments and affiliations with foundations and boards go on and on. Hailing from Cape Town, South Africa with her husband and son and here with us this morning, let's all please give a warm rotary welcome to Tendeka Tutu Shi. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah. Kind of. Well, you, is somebody still sleepy out there after all of these great talks? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. That, thank you. It's um, wonderful to be here, and I thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for inviting me. And there are names too numerous to mention. Otherwise, that would be the only thing I'm, I'm doing, and I wouldn't get a chance to tell you about Tutu Desk. So thank you to everyone who has welcomed me and has made it possible for me to be here today. 
developing youth and youth leadership is developing humanity. If we do not expand a further extraordinary and concerted effort on our girls and young women to ensure gender parity and equity by an understanding of the basic tenets of the world, then the world will continue to suffer by keeping girls and women down. Nothing will change. Women tend to be nurturers. Who can argue that Africa and the world needs a little more nurture? To nurture is to build, to sustain, and to create a lasting balance. Good leaders, the ones that make a positive difference, have a thirst for knowledge. It's difficult to change the things we are unaware of. If we do not offer our girls the basic tenets of understanding the world, then the world will continue to keep them down. Nothing will change. Change starts at the very foundation of learning. Change starts at school. Change starts with literacy. When we develop leaders, it's not just the female CEOs of the world that matter for the future. There are only so many CEO and senior positions to go around. In business, women leaders are found at all levels. The same applies in other areas of society and of course in families. Leaders impact the world around them, no matter the scale. We need to develop a pool of leaders so that we contribute to leadership from the top down, the bottom up, from within to without. Importantly, we are giving enough consideration and support to the grassroots achievement of functional literacy, without which vast swaths of our youth and girls in particular will never be able to develop to their full potential and contribute to the betterment of the world around them. When they learn those things they did not know, they will look at the world with a different perspective. They will be more analytical, more critical, better able to disseminate and understand information and behavior, holding others accountable and themselves responsible the foundations for true leadership. Accessing the formal structure, it starts with literacy. Access to financial literacy and training, it starts with literacy. Scaling opportunities, it starts with scaling literacy achievement. The education landscape for girl children is far more challenging than mere numbers indicate. Nine out of 10 of the world's poorest young women have not completed primary school. The United Nations again finds that gender inequalities are still deep rooted in every society. Women suffer from lack of access to decent work and face occupational segregation and gender wage gaps. In many situations, they are denied access to basic education and healthcare and are victims of violence and discrimination. They are underrepresented in political and economic decision-making processes. And again, to change this appalling landscape, it begins with education at the primary school level. We simply have to create an environment where education includes the rights of girls and women as an absolute where the tools exist in order to enable such an outcome, and we have to start early. The only way we eliminate discrimination against women, gender-based violence, and subjugation is by making the principles of equality and respect a foundational learning effort, ethos. This is where leaders are nurtured. It is terrifying that globally, 32 million girls of primary school age are out of school. 97 million adolescent girls 
of secondary school age are out of school. And it's unacceptable that almost a quarter of young women in developing countries, 116 million of them, aged 15 to 24, have never completed primary school. Two-thirds of the world's 774 million illiterate people in the world are female. Surely these numbers are an affront to our humanity and certainly an affront to the ideal of developing more women and women leaders. I believe that when we ignore a focused effort to offer our young girls the gift of literacy, the basis for not only leadership, but also self-development and knowledge, then unfortunately, we, st we will still be having these same conversations here in 20 years time. Leadership starts when we ourselves nurture the gateway to knowledge in our youth and a greater understanding of the world and their role in it. Growing up, whenever there was any, and I must say, I did promise my husband that I wouldn't do any male bashing <laughs> from, from the poll, but he's not here, so. <laughs> But, but no, I'm not going to bash any males, I promise. Growing, but I'm, I, I'm telling you the truth. Growing up, whenever there was anything to be done in our family, for the most part, it got done by the women. And coming together for, um, together and support, and not only the women in our family, but our immediate and extended family, but our family of sister friends and neighbors. So for sure, we do love our men, but from my experience, we truly depend for our very survival on our sisterhood of women to encourage us, support us, be our cheerleaders and ports of rest during a storm. So as women demand to be treated equally, pay the same as men, one for justice in healthcare and so many other basic rights. For me, one of the most basic, mo most important things is to start at the beginning and demand equal access to education. Because if we cannot get the most fundamental, the most basi basic things right for all, if we don't level the initial playing field from the onset, we are never going to win this war. And we are always going to be fighting the wages and work conditions and inequality forevermore. And this world, our world, all our world, will remain poorer for it. I believe that the only way we will eliminate discrimination, violence, and subjugation against women and girls is lift up our youth, is by ensuring access to education for our youth. Ensure that they have the tools with which to benefit from this access. Ensure that we're making the principles of equality and respect a foundational learning ethos for both girls and boys. The right to education states that education is a key element to achieving lasting peace and sustainable development. It is a powerful tool in developing the full potential of everyone and in promoting individual and collective well-being. The United Nations Education First Initiative states that education is not just a moral imperative, it is the smart choice. For every dollar invested in, in education generates 10 to 15 dollars return. Education is the basic building block of all societies. It provides knowledge of what the world offers, and this knowledge fires up ambition and aspiration. Aspiration leads to effort, and effort leads to a greater economic contribution. Education helps lift poor people out of poverty. It boosts economic growth. One extra year of schooling 
increases earnings by 10% for boys and 20% for girls. As much as one billion is lost annually by some countries by failing to educate the girls on the same level as boys. In brief, education is a human right, an empowerment right, an indispensable means of realizing other rights for our youth, and it contributes to the full development of the human personality, the community, the country, and the world. My first president, Nelson Mandela, said, no country can develop to its full potential unless its citizens are educated. <clears throat> On my beautiful home continent of Africa, in general, primary school attendance rates are high, but an estimated 42% will drop out before completing even this initial phase. Partly because the conditions in which children are expected to learn are so tough, which then has a domino effect of making t uh, teaching and learning an onerous burden. The solution is not only to get children into school. In context, that is actually the easy part. The challenge is to make the learning conditions in schools conducive to children staying in school. What does educating girls really mean in practical ways? Educated women are less likely to die in childbirth, can save millions of lives. Educating mothers improves children, child nutrition. Girls with higher levels of education are less likely to have children at an early age. Girls with higher levels of education are less likely to get married at an early age. Educated women are more likely to find work. With outcomes like these, we should be doing all we can to improve the educational experience of girls and youth wherever and however we can. Now, you'll excuse me, that was a rather longish spiel to lay the groundwork for me to talk about Tutu Desk. But you can blame my preacher father for passing on the gene of never getting to the point right away. <laughs> Just before I talk about it, I will hope you can show the video. I am proud to be the patron of the Tutu Desk campaign. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, over 95 million children who go to school do not have a desk. Globally, the numbers are even more staggering. The Tutu Desk is a simple yet critical part of the school infrastructure, which dramatically improves literacy development access, retention, and learning outcomes wherever it is deployed. We're proud to say that we have assisted over one million children through the Tutu Desk campaign thus far. But there is so much more to do. And through the Emergency Coalition, I commit to help the Tutu Desk campaign reach its goal of 20 million desks to 20 million children. forward to working with all of you to make sure that every child has the right to go to school and get an education. Because I'm somebody. Viva!
God bless you all and the important work that you do. So the, the modern definition of literacy is the ability to read as well as write. The ability to write in turn directly affects the development of numerical literacy. If children do not have a solid, stable surface to write on during their formative years in the primary phase of their education, then they will never, certainly almost never develop this ability and will fall out of the schooling system prematurely. In other words, they will forever be semi-literate. This has a major detrimental and domino effect, starting with their education and their ability to participate and compete economically for jobs, which further detrimentally affects the child's ability to participate in the world for the rest of their lives and in turn then also affects their families, their communities, their country, and ultimately their continent and their world. How can we ever hope that our children will take their place as fully competent, literate, global citizens with their counterparts in the rest of the world under such circumstances? How are we preparing the next generation of leaders when we're not even promote, providing the most basic of educational infrastructure, a classroom desk, to ensure they attain at least a functional level of literacy. This problem is endemic in emerging countries globally. South Africa has 11.8 learners and a desk shortage of 3 million. Mozambique has 9 million learners and a death shortage of 7 million. Uganda has 9.4 million learners and a death shortage of 5 million. I do really want to show you a tutu desk because sometimes you don't see it well enough on the... the so this is the rotary tutu desk. Um, And I am, I am proud to, sorry, I am proud to say that is actually manufactured exclusively in, in South Africa and not in China at all. <laughs> <laughs> Our production facilities and, and, and methodologies are world class and state of the art and we directly support job creation in our country which has an almost 50% adult unemployment rate. Tutu desk is not only a classroom desk, but also acts as a mobile or walking billboard when being carried between home and school. And the imprinted messaging interacts daily with fellow learners, community members, and family members in the household, which is a brilliant way of inculcating important social messaging. The beauty of the Tutu Desk is its flexible application. It can be used in any classroom situation, whether the classroom is a bricks and mortars building or which kids, where kids may actually have chairs but no desk, or even if the classroom is under a tree. It's given its mobility, the beneficiary child can take it home to use there when doing homework. For it's, our research shows that a child who attends a school where there are no desks is likely to be living in a home where there's nowhere for them to do their homework. Tutu Desk addresses one of the most basic yet most important education infrastructure needs for our children most in need. Already, so you can see that that was an, old, an oldish video. Um, but, and because my dad spoke about one million, we actually have reached two million children in 22 countries across Sub-Saharan Africa with sponsored tutu desks. 
Our goal is to provide 20 million children in need with a tutu desk by 2025. So we need your help desperately. A tutu desk in its most basic form is a stable, robust, and portable writing surface. However, over the course of many years of our work and outside of the hard facts and mat matrix as asserted through the independent uh, impact study done by AusAid, we have observed numerous additional intangible benefits. Tutu Desk is very often the first new anything that beneficiaries have received in their lives, and it provides recipients with a very real sense of dignity. An educational gift from our donors is a powerful voice that says to the child receiving it, you are worthwhile, you do matter. Somebody cares enough about your future to offer you the platform to build one on. Tutu Desk is more than anything else, a hand up, not a handout for our kids. It belongs to the child. It offers a unique sense of ownership. This is my desk. I will use it every day because I'm somebody. Those are words spoken by every child who gets a tutu desk at a handover. From my own experience, no statistic or description can impart or do justice to the emotion and excitement at a tutu desk handover. And it's inspiring that years after a handover, the tutu desks are still in schools, still being used, and still playing a critical, important role in literacy development. <clears throat> the, the most important improvement, other than, you know, homework delivery improving, children being able to write more effectively in class, their handwriting be more legible. The most important development is automaticity. Um, starting with handwriting, it's usually that ability to write is a fundamental indicator of an individual's ability to achieve. Once a child knows how to write, they can switch more of their focus from learning the mechanics of writing towards the content of what they are being taught. This is referred to as the automaticity of writing. If a child fails to develop this automaticity, not only will the quality of their work suffer, but they are also likely to, be, to fall behind on their academic work, struggle to develop effective literacy, have low self-esteem, and often suffer from behavioral issues. Again, using Africa as an example. Many students learn sitting outside, under a tree, or in overcrowded classrooms, where there simply isn't enough space for traditional desks, even if they were available. This again highlights the need for an alternative op option like our desk. Lifting up the next generation for us is leaving the world just a little bit better than we found it, especially for women and girls. When we commit to serving others, we often find that we also serve ourselves at the same time. Humanity is a really strange thing. The gift of giving is very often also the gift of receiving. The joy and excitement on the faces of the children when they receive a tutu desk is indescribable. Our children are excited about education because they understand that it is a way for them to improve their lives and is a way out of the depths of poverty for themselves and their families. Lifting up the next generation through education and the gift of a tutu desk offers a unique outcome. The change is instant and measurable. The true gift of the tutu desk is that it is a generational gift. It allows this generation to better their circumstances 
in order to smooth the road for the next. It is hoping that the world that our grandchildren will inherit will be a little less onerous, a little more just, a little fairer and more equal, especially for our daughters and other young women around the world. A source of encouragement for me in the work we do to keep on keeping on trying to lift up the next generation of youth and women comes from Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. No matter what you do or what field of life you do it, there's always room for us to leave the world a better place for others. It is possible to raise and lift up the next generation of leaders through education. It just requires a little belief, a little conviction, a little more reaching out, and maybe just a little bit more action, because we are all bound together as members of one family, the human family, and we are responsible for one another. I will close with a quote from my dad. Now, I must say, when I was much younger in my teens, I would never, ever quote my dad. <laughs> because firstly, if you could quote him, it meant that you were actually listening to what he was saying. <laughs> and that is so totally uncool for a teenager. And seriously, uncool was not a good thing on a teenage resume. Now, having passed through and survived the fire and brimstone of having raised a teenager myself many, many, many moons ago, I long gave up trying to be cool. I am inspired by the many Rotarian stories I have heard and what many of you are doing, which to my mind encapsulates this quote of his. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those bits of good that overwhelm the world. We at Tutu Desk are asking you to help us overwhelm the world and lift up our youth through education, education, education. Thank you. Good day. I'm Sonia Labasco from District 6980, and I'm the district governor nominee. Tendika, thank you for sharing the campaign story about Tutu Desk campaign and the difference it's making for the children of Africa. There's so much to get behind this project education, equality, literacy, sustainability, limited environmental impact, but mostly important, the hope for the future. I want to be in your sisterhood. I want to be a sister. You are. <laughs> it has come to our attention that there's some that would be interested in purchasing the tutu desk. Please see Sean Sawyer after our talk today. We have a special gift for you today. On behalf of our director, Jeremy Hurst, RI director, please accept this Paul Harris fellow in recognition for the difference that you're making for the children in Africa. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Can I, can I give you a hug? We are. <laughs> We are thrilled she made it today. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're a wonderful lady. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage District Governor Leslie Rondani from District 7030. Can, sorry, before they, they come, can I just ask one thing? Why didn't anyone tell me about wearing purple today? Oh. <laughs> what, what type of sisters are you? Hey, where's come Marcy? On. Hey, Marcy, where's Marcy? <laughs> can I get, let me help you Good morning. Yesterday, we got a snippet 
of the texting lingo of Gen X. Today, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce one of our brightest sparks, sparks in District 7030 from Trinidad and Tobago, Giselle Holder. Giselle, Giselle is a qualified management specialist, electrical and computer energy, uh, engineer. Her rotary journey began when she was pinned as a member of the Rotaract Club of Port of Spain West. It was during her tenure there that Giselle developed a passion for youth empowerment and community service. Her 10 years of service as a Rotaractor saw her serving in many positions in her club. In 2015-16, she was elevated to district Rotaract representative and Rotaract co-chair for the joint Rotary Rotaract District 7030 conference in Trinidad in April 2017. Giselle transitioned to Rotary when she was inducted as a member of the Rotary Club of Maraval, serving in all capacities and is a past president of the club. She was the district Rotaract chair 21-22 and is now serving as assistant governor, governor for the North Cluster of the Trinidad Clubs. She was appointed as an assistant Rotary coordinator for Zone 34 with special focus on Rotaract. Her passion still for Rotaract, Giselle hopes to continue to publicize, optimize, and celebrate the wonderful work and experience of our Rotaractors and the wider Rotary family within our district and worldwide. Please welcome Giselle to the podium. So the word to that is actually, once a trini reach in your fet is niceness. That's what the words are. And I am your trini. Good morning, everyone. Um, and please allow me to give a special good morning to President Jen. This is the first time ever I am in the presence of a are our president while they are president, right? We know Uncle Barry, <laughs> but <laughs> this is cool. This is really, really cool. So, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. And of course, good morning to all our Rotary and Rotaract royalty and Interact royalty also in your room. Um, it's really wonderful to be here to share, imagine, and become. And you will see that I'm here to really tell a story. We heard a lot of storytelling today. I am no storyteller, actually, but it is wonderful to just share, right? And hopefully, I'll be as not nervous as possible. Before I go on, though, I will be using Trinidadian dialect, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, but I think you'll understand, and I'll certainly try to break it down. <laughs> I also want to shout out to our 2022 Emerging Leaders class, guys. Woot woot. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So, sorry, I do a lot of presentations. So, it's like, just you did an overview. It's like, what is this? Right? So, I'm clicking over that. Um, clicking over this one, too. Okay, great. So, going straight to sharing, um, my story, as you heard from what, P what DG Leslie shared, I think that I'm sometimes amazed as to what, you know, my own Rotary journey is. Because from day one, I kept feeling like I kept falling into things, right? That's, that's kind of how things have been going for me for <laughs> my entire Rotary life. Um, my introduction to Rotaract slash Rotary um, was really by accident, and it was due to my love for a lime. So for those who don't know, liming in Trinidad and Tobago is to hang out or to party, right? So one of my, um, my friends in my university invited me to go to Tobago for an all-inclusive weekend for 100 US. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> right? And it turned out to be an annual event hosted by the Rotary Club of Tobago. Right, I did not know that. I had a fab fabulous time. And in coming back to Trinidad, um, once again, as life would have it, would have it, sorry, I met with a Rotaractor 
from the Rotary Club of Port of Spain West. And he shared with me some high level details and invited me to the meeting the next week. So that was basically how it started. So I always tell everyone it was for the love of the line that I joined our great organization. <laughs> of course, there's a difference between why you join as opposed to why you stay. The staying part was very interesting because that, of course, reflected what Rotaractors do best, service, okay? And we had such wonderful opportunities within our own district right there in 7030 to do so much and to just be aware of how much bigger life was, you know, as compared to our own organization. And I remember also just in terms of presidency, my presidency in, in Rotary Club of Port of Spain West, you know, it, it really was another oops, <laughs> because we had, back then, we had an age limit, so lucky Rotary actors, Rolindo, Monica, be glad. We had to leave at 30. So what happened was that they left, they all left, 10 Rotary actors left our club at age 30, forcing the remaining few spanking new Rotary actors to have to step up and lead. But we did have a great foundation. And I saw that falling into yet again as an opportunity to bring all that I am, you know, all that I was at that time, um, being a young engineer, working in project management and trying to apply that to the role. Now, I would say that my few, my first few months were horrible. Um, I think I forgot a lot of the basic things, um, primarily just listening to my membership and also just remembering that what we do best in Rotary is really share ourselves. I think I was trying to be, you know, that ruler with a big stick and trying to rein people in, but I was, um, in true Caribbean style, I was brought back to reality very quickly I would not share the words that were said to me, but um, certainly <laughs> it brought it all into perspective very quickly. And um, I think I became my true self, <laughs> enjoying Rotaract and certainly enjoying the journey while encouraging those um, others to do the same. I think too, another thing that, that sparked my, my interest and of course shared um, or rather helped me grow that passion for Rotaract um, was the opportunity to travel and to see other countries. Our district, just like 7020, is very unique in terms of we comprise countries, right? So when we can't just drive <laughs> and go to another um, another club, you know, we have to actually hop on a plane and pay the equivalent prices to a tourist to actually make these trips. So just that exposure and the opportunity to be a leader at a very young age was both scary, but um, looking back now, it really, really was beneficial to being able to be here and to share my story. Um, everything else, becoming DRR, District Rotaract representative, was also a stumble, right? A stumbling block in terms of, I was supposed to be the deputy. We had that role that supported our DRR. And the person going up for DRR just decided not to. And I was like, you set me up. <laughs> so what happened there too was another moment of falling um, in place, but thankfully having a great foundation with my Rotary Club being able to serve a very wonderful year with my Rotary Actors in 7030. Um, it was coming down to the last years. I see PDG Roger right there. He would have come and said, you know, Jizzy, I'm looking for us to do something different with conference. I want to join Rotary and Rotaract, and I was like, hmm, okay. So <laughs> he then um, said, yeah, yeah, and if you could help us plan it. So that was phenomenal. Uh, um, we saw, I think it was a thousand plus of our Rotarians and Rotaractors coming together in Trinidad and Tobago, celebrating Rotary 
and really just, you know, it was another experience to just really open us up to the world of Rotary. I think, ooh, I'm forgetting, I need to click. There we go. Also, the images that you're seeing are images that would have been developed by our Rotaract leadership over the years to celebrate their themes, okay? So I apologize, Marshall, or anyone else who's a public image um, police, okay? It was back then, all right? It was back then, right? We were just having fun. <laughs> but each of them tell a story. The one previously, actually, the theme was to share your story, right? And this one is about making a difference, leaving your mark. So my story, as I said, from Rotaract, of course, um, even going into Rotary came out of that um, opportunity to co-chair our first joint Rotary, um, Rotaract Rotary Conference. And I joined a different club. I was from the Rotaract Club of Port Swimmers, but I joined the Rotary Club of Maraval. And that was very contentious. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Because as you know, your sponsor club is like your family, right? It's like your parents. So you're telling your parents, I'm moving out. I'm going to live with somebody else, <laughs> right? May not always be well received. But as true parents, they do come around and celebrate, you know, choices that they see eventually pan out for you. And I continue in enjoying the support of the Rotary Club of Fort Spain West, certainly as I move on. So at this point, um, as I said, we'll go to, I'll share, we'll imagine a bit, and then we'll talk about becoming. Um, I will share about the imagining part because I think as a root, and I still refer to myself as a rotor actor because once a rotor actor, always a rotor actor, okay? We can't shake it off. Um, but it's, the, it's a great opportunity as a young leader right, to be able to imagine. And I think part of the story, part of the journey, was that there were so many times that we would just sit down as young persons and just imagine. Imagine what it would be like to not be a Rotarian. Sorry, it wasn't that, I'm sorry. It was really just to go and help or go and do a project in another country, to go to an RI conference, to um, do an exchange, right? And those were things at the time that it was almost mind blowing to us, right? Just, you know, thinking about it and being able to do it. And I'm really glad that we were actually able to do some of these things because that then encouraged us to imagine even more, okay? So it's an opportunity also for us here as members of Rotary to imagine being able to tap into the power and passion and pure energy of our youth and apply it to what we do best, which is service. Imagine being given the opportunity to work with young men and women, some now working on their careers, now figuring out life, but being able to offer them life-changing guidance. Imagine being able to also receive insight and the opportunity for co-mentoring, because I think we all recognize that there's so much to learn from our young people, from our rotor actors, and certainly from that age group, right? In terms of their brilliance as it entails with new technology. Imagine seeing your typical, and in some cases, outdated project structures being blown apart, but pieced together in the most innovative, and creative ways. Imagine effortlessly embracing a new membership type that has the potential not only to grow our great organization, but also bring even more value, stability, and increase our sustainability as they grow up in Rotary. It's much closer to reality, I think, for us because we don't really need to imagine that much, right? Thankfully, Zone 33 and Zone 34, we celebrate, I think, a very healthy Rotaract relationship and Rotaract existence. However, there's always more, more opportunities for us to recognize the value that our Rotaract membership brings to our organization 
and also touches briefly to get a little bit technical on the return on investment that your support of your Rotorac Club actually brings and is able to generate. And this can certainly be, and I think in many parts is our reality in our zones. So here you have just, um, oh, clicky thing, come on, right there. There you have four, um, would have been each, re each representing a year, right? From each of our DRRs. And each image, if you realize, um, from the theme really encourages you to step out there, right? Because it's asking you to be real. So yes, we want to imagine. Yes, we want to grow Rotaract. Yes, we want to share our stories. But we have to be very real. There are some real obstacles out there that are preventing us from doing so. Because we know it's not just about going out there and finding 15 young people and telling them, you know, come, let's join a Rotary Club or let's create a Rotary Club. We need to meet them where they are. I'm also not encouraging you guys to have to go to any clubs or anything of the sort to recruit. But the idea is that um, I'm sure we already work with so many young people. And it's just that opportunity to invite them to have a conversation. I think that's one of the greatest takeaways from forums or, or conventions or anything where we meet together because we get to talk to so many different people that otherwise we wouldn't, right? We'll kind of stay in our bubble. So it's a true opportunity to meet with your local universities. Continue that conversation. I know that it is challenging at times to, of course, follow all the step-by-step -step rules within that university environment. However, there are other opportunities through community-based Rotaract clubs that we can certainly build upon. Our Rotaractors are service-focused, but they also have certain core values and interests that they must have satisfied before they join any organization else they will just move on. Rotary is really cool, right? But we have to ensure that it's cool for everyone. We as Rotarians must be that listening ear that allows for them to create a space that they are comfortable in and provides a necessary and much needed sound advice that many of them will be very open to. We need to tap into our resources within RI and oddly, I don't know if you've seen this, but one of my points is find yourself an oddly. Okay, reason being. <laughs> reason being is that we need to find the information. So if you're not sure as to how to start a Rotary Club, you know, you're not too clear on, you know, what is the steps needed, we have persons, you know. So let's, let's tap into our oddlies, let's talk to our ERCs, Let's talk to our MDIOs, right? I should have had a prize, anybody who knows what that is, right? <laughs> but that, of course, is our multi-district informational organizations which deal with Rotaractors, districts coming together. And our Rotaractors aren't even trying to figure out DEI. They already are the definition of that for, right? Yeah. So chat with them, and I'm quite sure you'll be blown away by the ways in which they are celebrating the differences that we naturally have within our communities. So I hope Marcy is proud. I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> our Rotaractors, to me, represent very easily some of the best characteristics that we have within our organization. They are a family. They are service-driven. They rely heavily on their membership, and because of that, they see growing membership as a natural extension of their club. They are advocates and implementers of DEI. They're flexible, and they're people who can rail line. The image, of course, that I have up there is none other than our theme this year, but you'll see next to it, right? Marshall, don't look at it. You'll see next to it, the image that is being used by my district, by our Rotaractors, that they actually were inspired by in the Imagine Rotary. And for them, 
their understanding of Imagine Rotary is all about thinking big. It's about literally having no cap. It's about getting out of our comfort zones. It's about identifying impossible needs and creating real and tangible solutions. It's about thinking big, which is not very easy, right? Because we're all limited by our community, by our personal beliefs, right? But it's that opportunity for us to be able to imagine all that we can do as both individuals and as clubs. It allows us to not only be intentional and purposeful in our service, but also to do better and be better in all that we do. And so in true millennial style, you will see that's a QR code that I did not press as yet. There we go, right? So Sid Lee, if you wanna connect some more, chat some more about Rotaract, I am very much available. Liz is also in the room. Liz is me in zone 33, right? So please um, talk with her too. And I take this opportunity to say thank you to our zones for taking a chance, right? Um, both Liz and I and Mark and Son, we are obviously not PDGs, but we are now ARCs. And we certainly hope to make you guys proud and certainly make that a norm as we move on. So I take this opportunity to thank you. I hope you connect with me and certainly with everyone who's here. And thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Giselle. And it was amazing, it was an amazing speech. I'm sure and your experience going to be very helpful for us to make Rotaract growing in your areas. I'm not going to change the script, I'm going to just change the glasses, <laughs> and because I don't have a purple grass. And well, now is my pleasure. Oh, by the way, I don't introduce myself. My name is Douglas Heiser. I'm the district governor elect for the district 6930 in the great state of Florida. Uh, and now is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Michael Kathleen. He is also from the great state of Florida. He is the district governor of 469, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Still is. My name is uh, Michael Kesty. I'm very proud this year to serve as district governor for Rotary International District 6990 which includes Miami, Fort Lauderdale, the Keys, and Grand Bahama Islands. So very proud of that opportunity. And one of the benefits we have as district governors this year is we get to wear this beautiful tie. And I guess I got a, something very special. Mine is not only signed by President Jen, it actually has a little heart on it. So I show this off everywhere I go. I show this off everywhere I go. So thank you again, President Jen. Oh, um, I don't only have the honor to introduce one special person today. I get to introduce two very special people to you today. And both are, I'll say in, in my words, not only what makes Rotary, but will be making more of Rotary. Say it that way. So a few days ago, we had an audience with Director Jeremy. And during that uh, audience with Director Jeremy, he told us that as DGs, he felt that he had something to do with our growth and development as being DGs. And we said, oh, that's great. And, and, all. and he said, as a matter of fact, he felt like he had something to do with our birth. He said, not like a parent, but like a grandparent. So from now on, President Jeremy, you will forever be known, I'm sorry, Director Jeremy. <laughs> I just had a Karnak moment here, I guess. <laughs> My apologies, but Director Jeremy, from now on, you will be now known as Grandpa Jeremy. <laughs> so Grandpa Jeremy. And please know, Grandpa Jeremy, that every year we expect a birthday card with a crisp $100 bill in it from now on, okay? <laughs> so, anyway, Jeremy Hurst. 
uh, currently RI director for zones 34, 33, 34, and conveyor of this very week. Frankly, he is what many of us, including myself, aspire to be as Rotarians as we grow. He's an amazing leader and selfless mentor who brings his passion to everything he's involved in. He has an energy that is contagious and dedication to service that is infinite. Since joining Rotary in 1988, he has served as, as, on numerous RI committees and has had the pleasure of serving as RI president's representative or multiple times. He is truly a man of action. He has chaired multiple disaster relief committees, helping people regain their lives after devastating hurricanes. And this is really special. He's the founding member, one of the founding members, and chair of the steering committee for Hand Wash. As you know, that's the Rotary-led partnership to bring clean water, improve sanitation and hygiene to all citizens of Haiti. It's rare to see Jeremy without a smile, very rare. But when you see pictures of him spending time with his lovely bride, Michelle, and his family, his smile gets much wider and deeper. The only time I've ever seen him smile as much was last year at the Zone Conference when he got up on stage in a 60s outfit and a wig and he danced with us. He danced with us. That was a blast. And Michelle, I think, took some opportune pictures of him, which she will obviously use the next time she wants a new purse. So we'll put it that way. Anyway. So, the other thing that Jeremy is passionate about besides his family and in, all is his generosity for fundraising for Rotary. And it is boundless. Michelle and he are major donors and members of the Bequest, Paul Harris, and Polio Plus Societies, among others. Quite an honor. So, Joining Jeremy today on stage is a lovely young lady named Hannah Shin. She is truly an inspiration. She's an example of what many of us wish we were when we were young. A person who has learned the joys of committing, ser committing service, committed to service, I'm sorry, at a very young age. She's a beacon of hope, inspiring both young and old. In her role as vice chair of Rotary International Interact Advisory Council, she has represented interactors worldwide. During her five-year journey, she has been a leader, a founder, and willing volunteer to provide service above self, as she says, at every opportunity. Her steadfast focus to bring peace to our world is amazing. She's done this, these accomplishments and others at a very young age. Can you imagine what she's gonna do in the future? Can you just imagine what she's gonna do in the future? She's uh, dedicated her talents to public service and building age and disability friendly communities. Our world will always have challenges, but with young people like Hannah, we can all rest assured they're turning into great opportunities for a better world and a better community for all of us. I found out from Hannah this morning that she likes to clap loudly. So what I would like all of us to do is clap very loudly for Hannah and our RI director, Jeremy. Thank you. a lovely space and all the speakers are so inspirational but I'd just like to start off by saying I'm really grateful to be here uh, especially as I'm representing the Interact Advisory Council or the IAC which I certainly consider to be a second family to me. Um, so for today we have planned a little Q&A style talk. Uh, Director Jeremy or dare I say Grandpa Jeremy uh, and I, I, I still got to see that video of him in the wig. I'll check it out later. Um, yes, for sure. But we're going to be having an organic conversation about the IAC or youth engagement in general. And so we hope you'll enjoy kind of listening to us kind of thought dump on you and talk about what matters to us and what we've seen so far. And I'm really happy to be here today. And you will see those photographs later, I believe you. Oh, <laughs> looking forward to it. 
So it, it is wonderful to be here with Hannah. She's absolutely amazing. Uh, you've, some of you heard me say that if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. That now applies to stages as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question, so what, Hannah, is the Interact Advisory Council? Hannah? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's why I'm here. Um, but essentially, the IAC is a body of eight interactors and two alumni members who advise the RI Board of Directors on policies and programming and perspectives that youth share and that matter to them. And so I love the IAC and I once heard it said that Interact is the future of Rotary and I believe that the IAC is the living, breathing organ that proves RI's commitment to sustaining this future uh, and to really empowering the youth who make up this body. And the IAC I also like to consider as a pipeline that strengthens your transition from Interact to Rotaract and then to Rotary. And so I love the Rotary wheel. I think it's such a beautiful icon that represents Rotary International. And I like to think of the wheel as almost a snowball that collectively uh, increases experiences and moments that youth go through. So in Interact to Rotaract to Rotary, their experiences snowball and get them more and more involved in Rotary until there's no leaving. I'm in too deep. Um, but essentially, that is the heart and soul of the IAC and really fostering those connections and those voices. I think this question is for me. Um, so why did RI create an Interact Advisory Council made up of only youth? Great question. Well, let's, let's just look what... <laughs> Let's look at what Interact is, 400,000 Interactors. Did you know that globally in 152 countries, in uh, 492 of our districts, almost everywhere, and over 17,000 clubs? That's a massive presence. But think about it. How much of that voice, how much of their opinions, how much of what they feel do we hear, perhaps even at our Rotary Clubs, not even our Rotary Clubs, at district level, at zone level, most importantly at the board? board wanted to hear that authentic voice of our interactors, that youth voice. And for that reason, we decided not to set up another committee and have to go to council legislation and be formed and have structures and build your respect, be populated by past district governors who well, they knew about road interact. What we wanted to hear for, what we wanted to give a seat to the table at was that voice of youth and interact. And that's the reason. I also do want to preface that we totally wrote these questions ourselves and are hyping them up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's really beautiful and everyone in the IAC appreciates that it's uh, a predominantly youth space that is talking about issues that youth care about. And I guess kind of to add like a sentimental angle about the IAC, something we love is that it's really fostered genuine friendships and it feels like a friend group almost. And I hope you all know that Rotary is a pretty good place to make friends, I would say, um, or at least if you have friends not in Rotary, you bring them and ask them to join because you know Rotary is such a great space. And so I think having a space predominantly for youth by youth has really allowed us to become really good friends and we know we can keep each other accountable decades from now. Um, when we'll get super busy with Rotary work, we'll be like, hey, do you remember those good old days when we were sitting in a Zoom call chatting about uh, things that seem really far away now, uh, off in the distance. So, yeah, we, we love the space that was made for us, and we feel really appreciated and seen and heard. So I have a, I have a question for Director Jeremy. Um, how do you think youth enrich RI? Mm, mm, that's an interesting one. How does youth enrich <laughs> RI? Let me, throw the, let me throw your question to the audience. How many of you have used a taxi in your lifetime? I'm putting Hannah on the spot now. We brought Hannah in from Massachusetts where she's attending Harvard. Way, way to go, Hannah, great job. And she arrived at the airport and we realized that she wasn't of the age where she could get a Lyft or Uber. So she had to get a taxi. But she'd never taken a taxi before. That, that resonated with me last night because <laughs> at the end of the day, what we want in Rotary, what we need in Rotary, is a different perspective, a different lens looking at Rotary from that youth perspective. Now, what we have as Rotarians sometimes as we move forward, we have experience, but sometimes we also have the tendency to impose our precepts, our concepts on what our youth should do. And 
And we wanted to be able to see and understand and what we do see from this uh, tonight from uh, the Interactive Advisory Council is through a totally different lens. A lens that perhaps comes without some of the baggage that we've carried and brought through life with us and a perspective that is very new and fresh. That would be my answer. I appreciate that. Yes. As, as a youth, I really do love that. I feel like RI makes youth feel very seen and heard and valued and welcomed. The amount of people here who have just smiled at me when they saw a clueless, confused 17-year-old walking around this, uh, this hotel, it's really made me feel welcome. So I guess on the flip side, I can toot all of your horns um, and talk about how RI enriches youth. And I think there are two pillars that I'd really like to touch upon, which is number one, cultural humility, and then number two, tangible life advice. And so the first is cultural humility, which is a concept I rather recently learned about, but have grown very fond of. And so I had heard about this idea of cultural literacy, which is essentially that we need to develop a fundamental understanding of other people's cultures and their values and their norms and how they shape their behaviors and actions. And cultural humility is an interesting twist to that, that essentially throws up your hands and says, all right, I really will never understand your culture, but I want to. And so it's sitting down with open arms and open ears, hoping to be educated and also uh, to be able to respond to what we learn uh, about other people's cultures and what matter to them. And I feel that RI, especially the International and Rotary International, has made this idea of cultural humility extremely relevant and refreshing for me. Uh, in the IAC, we have a lot of diversity um, across geographic regions and lived experiences. And I remember that setting up the RI IAC calls, that was the first time I ever realized that time zones are actually kind of relevant. Um, and yes, like I was joining into the call, I was like, oh my goodness, it's 9 a.m., like I'm not a morning person, this is, this is gonna be rough. And someone was like, oh yeah, by the way, it's 3 a.m. right now. And I was like, oh gosh, like mad respect for that. Um, but my eyes just kept getting more and more opened as I learned about um, the fellow members of my IAC and, and had really cool conversations with them. I remember one of our members from India and I were talking about how female engagement in India and Rotary, their programs look different than in the US. And uh, my friend from Italy asked me to do a little video interview for her club and they were asking me questions like, what is prom? And what do you do for Halloween? And it was such an interesting experience that I became very fond of. Um, and then I would say for the life advice part, I feel like Rotarians give really good life advice. And um, yeah, I know, I, I don't know what you all think about that, but I think, I think objectively speaking, I've gotten some pretty good advice from district conferences and also shout out to District 7305. I don't know where you all are sitting, but um, oh yes, over there, much love. Um, but that is my home district. And I remember that at one specific Interact Youth Conference that the district held, there was a guest speaker named Chris Riddell. And he told us this one quote that he said was his biggest piece of advice for all the youth in the room. And he said, live so that parking at your funeral will be a real pain in the butt. <laughs> and that was a really interesting perspective, right? And we were like, oh gosh darn it, like we, you know, it's kind of dark, um, but also really timely and always really important to think about. And I remember, uh, like these collections of rotary conversations have started to shift my values and the way that I see myself in the world and the way that I see other people and how they influence me and also the rest of the world. So I love the advice we've gotten here also today. All the speakers, I, I feel like you will have our fountains of wisdom to share. And so I think in that way, RI continues to enrich the youth community. And grandpa's always here for you whenever you need it. Oh, I feel much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for that. So let's ask, how can members, clubs, districts, and zones support youth? Why don't we split this between us? That's a long question. Why don't you take members and clubs and I'll deal with districts and zones? So back over to you. Yeah, I think that sounds good. So I would say that on a relatively smaller scale of members and clubs, a lot of what's very important is, first of all, interact clubs. Interact clubs are the lifeblood uh, of youth engagement in Rotary, as well as RILA and the Rotary Youth Exchange. But I would say that as members, reaching out to youth in the community and actually having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them 
Um, I know it feels like youth are detached and always on our phones or I don't know, any other stereotype, but I actually do remember and treasure the one-on-one -on -one conversations that I had with Rotarians, especially earlier on in my Rotary journey. And so I think making time for youth and sitting down and not only listening, but also sharing your stories. Um, you might not think you're interesting, but other people probably do. And so I think really having those conversations and then for clubs, sponsoring interact clubs or uh, creating training opportunities to go visit clubs and uh, allow the interact club leaders to know how they, like know the, the stance of interact with respect to Rotary and understand that they are part of a larger family, that would be invaluable. That's a great answer. And you know, this may look like we just met and just got on the stage and it's totally spontaneous, but actually we've been <laughs> plotted in the background with some of this. So, I'm happy to announce that Zones 33 and 34 are about to move forward with an initiative, which will be a regional version of the Interact Advisory Council, and you're looking at our chair and advisor here right now. <laughs> so, as far as Rotary is concerned, we believe in regionalization. We believe in creating a regional presence and providing you, the districts, with resources to be able to go forward and build structures. Now that may sound like a top-down approach, but it's not really. It's much more of a pull-up approach. We want to give you the opportunity to have your interactors have their voice at zone level and provide the resources that you need as districts so your clubs can go out there and do a much better job taking those interact clubs, bringing them on that rotary journey and into our family on a permanent basis. Yes, I love that. And then our last but not least, um, oh, I guess the slides are not here, so I will just read it for you all. Um, but, oh, there it is. See, Marshall is so receptive, I love that. Um, and so for us, our last question is, what can or should it look like moving forward? And it is pur uh, purposefully ambiguous, but in this context, I guess you can talk about youth engagement or RI in general or interact programs. Um, but I think one thing I'll say is that I love me a good slogan. I love Imagine the Rotary. I love Be More with Baltimore, or hashtag Be More Rotary. Um, as Gen Z, I do appreciate a good hashtag. Um, but I will say that thinking about the exciting capacity for imagination reminded me of a quote that I recently heard uh, in one of the classes that I'm taking right now. And so there's this man, an anthropologist named David Graeber, and he once defined human life as, quote, a collection of fragile beings taking care of one another. And that quote really resonated with me and I sat and let it marinate in my brain. I know marinate's a weird word. Um, but I was just thinking about it and uh, just reflecting upon what it meant. And I think that RI holds the exciting capacity to create this new trend of caring deeply and broadly. We care about many things. We care about many people across many countries and continents. But we also care very deeply. Our heart breaks when we hear stories of pain and suffering. Uh, we, we care deeply about each other too. Um, you know, each other's joys and successes are our own and when other people are going through really hard things, we also feel secondhand the weight that that holds. And so I think something I'm really excited about for youth engagement is making sure that they understand the larger context of the Rotary family that they're a part of and that they feel taken care of, but that they also have opportunities to take care of one another and then contribute back to the larger mother organization that is Rotary. And so I think rethinking and re-examining the way youth are incorporated into Rotary is something that is very promising and very important. And so I'm really excited uh, to continue to be involved in Rotary. Uh, I've been involved since eighth grade and, and now like as a first year in college, I've been thinking a lot about what I can do for Rotary moving forward, especially since I just recently graduated Interact. And so I think there's a lot of exciting room for growth and we don't know exactly what lies there, but there's so much creativity uh, and imagination that can be poured into that. So I'm also looking forward to talking with any and every one of you all who has ideas for youth engagement or wants to talk more about it. But yes, I will pass it on to the one and only Grandpa Jeremy for your closing remarks. Closing remarks. <laughs> I don't think I need to say anything else other than what's been said there. <laughs> This exemplifies our future. This is why we need the voice of youth and what a voice Hannah has. Thank you so much, Hannah, for being who you are, for your job you're doing. Keep up the wonderful work.
Go Rotary. Thank you, everyone. My name is Dennis Calta Jerome, and I am the district governor nominee for District 6990, uh, which is Southeast Florida, the Florida Keys, and Grand Bahama Island, and our governor's course, Michael. As a former educator, this session was particularly important to me, and as our future as an organization is clearly dependent on the young lives we engage in what we do, the knowledge we share, and the skills we take the time to teach. From the emphasis on raising up youth in South Africa through the Tutu Desk Project to the voices of our Rotaractarian and our Interactor, we should all leave this session in awe of what the future can hold for us. And clearly, fellow Rotarians, this is a seize the moment time. And before we break for lunch, I have a couple of quick announcements. Please do not linger in this room. As you heard earlier, the hotel staff need time to prepare this room for lunch and I don't know about you, but I'm ready to eat again. After lunch, please rejoin us at 2 p.m. for an exciting, insightful discussion with some of our speakers and RI President Jennifer. And this is one of the highlights of the summit. Thank you all so much. Do not linger beyond your way.